Let's talk about Board Quest, Tales of Lyria, an upcoming miniature skirmish game designed for all skill levels. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to preview a game that's coming to crowdfunding very soon. I'll put a link to the campaign in the show notes below the video. Uh, this is a game that's it, it's a skirmish, a miniature skirmish game. There's sort of adventure elements to it. There's monster fighting and treasure gathering and experience building. Uh, and it's designed for all skill levels, for newbies all the way up to folks who are more experienced with these kinds of board games. It's called Board Quest Tales of Lyria by Ramesware? Ramesware? I don't know how to pronounce the publisher of this game. I'll see if I can find a phonetic pronunciation to go below the video. Uh, but here's the box for this prototype. This is a game for between two and four players. Kids age 12 and up can play this game. So it's not just for teenagers and older. Kids age 12 and up can play this one. It takes an hour to two hours to get through a game though. Let's take a deeper look at Board Quest, Tales of Lyria by Ramesware Games. Board Quest is light to medium in terms of its complexity, and it is a game where you're moving these miniatures. Now, the prototype has standees rather than miniatures, but you're moving these minis around the board, and you're either trying to win by controlling a certain number of forts in a 2v2 game. You're going to, your team will need to control eight forts in order to win, or you're trying to just defeat the other players in the game. Once all of their heroes are knocked off the board, that's game over for them. So how do you play this thing? Well, first of all, remember, this is a prototype. So the components may change, the artwork, even the rules might get updated. Uh, the, I'm, I'm working from the version 1.0 of the rule book here. But you've got different heroes that have asymmetric abilities. So there's a human warrior, there's an orc faction, there are demons, and there are elves. And they all play very differently. They have different abilities. Each player is going to have their player board. Each player also has three different characters that they can also recruit. We've got an archer here who'll have a ranged attack. Uh, and they have two decks of cards that they're going to be working from. That gives them their skills. And like I said, it does make make each character, each faction play a little bit differently. The elves are sneaking around in the forest, for example. I, I got to play as the elves in the games that I played uh, because I like to be the sneaky ones. So elves can sneak around in the forest and they tend to be ranged attackers with arrows, for example. Whereas if you're playing as, as the human warrior, you want to get up close and personal with your sword. Each player is also going to have, uh, in, in addition to the cards and the minis for, for the characters that they can recruit and their own player board and their decks, you're also going to get a player board to track experience and your income each turn. So you're going to get plus one income. You start with a base income of five. You're going to get plus one income for every fort you own, but minus one for each of those characters that you recruit. And these are big, thick. You can see how thick this thing is. These are nice, deep, dual-layer player boards, even in the prototype. The, the only knock on them, I guess I would say, is that the cubes that came with the game don't quite fit in those little openings in the player boards. So we still had to balance them on top. So you're tracking experience points that you get from defeating monsters or from fighting the other players. As your hero levels up, they're going to increase in health and their damage is going to increase, their defense will increase, and they get some advanced skills. So those two decks of cards that you get, one are, those are the basic skills that you can use. For example, one of the cards that Gregor the Mighty had would allow him to charge in, to move an attack on the same turn but you get more advanced, more powerful abilities as you level up. So each time you level up, you're going to add a couple of advanced powers into your deck. So you'll choose a faction, and like I said, each faction has unique abilities. You're going to deal out these map tiles at random, and then you're building the map before the game begins, and then players are going to gradually add their forts to the map, and then, then they'll place their, their hero miniatures on, on the fort that's closest to them, and then you're going to start moving in to play that game. So heroes can recruit one of those other characters like I showed you. They can buy or sell items. Uh, they can move on the map. They can attack these other monsters. They can play their skill cards. 
the the items make it fun too if you attack a monster and kill it you're going to get xp you're going to get some coins <laughs> there's always loot involved and you're going to get some item card they always drop some item card and the items have different rarities uh, first level characters can only equip common items but once you're second level you can add the uncommon ones and then there are very powerful rare items so it is one of those games where it's it is exciting to see what kinds of items your your characters can get uh, and and to upgrade those characters as you play through the game your hero is kind of unlimited in the things that he can do in that as long as you've got the mana to spend for a card or the money to spend to recruit, you can upgrade your characters that, that you recruit as well and they get more powerful as they reach higher levels. Um, they've got these, these, this is your income. Uh, they're not metal coins, but they are, uh, even in the prototype, they're very thick cardboard coins here. So the, the components here are very high quality for a prototype, I will say. If you want to claim a fort, you that's where you sort of forego your turn. Your character has to be on the fort and they just they can do nothing else except for claim that fort. And then it becomes yours. It counts towards the victory condition. And then once a team of two gets eight of those, then they're going to win the game. If you own a fort and you're standing on it, that adds to your defense. There are different features of the terrain. If you're in the water, it lowers your defense value, but you can't be burned, for example. So it, it is there are some complexities to it as you play through but it's not so complicated the way that it works is that starting with the lead player who who is chosen by a high roll on these two d6s uh you're you're just going to spend your coins and spend your mana and move your characters around the map now you might attack a monster you might attack a, another player's character recruited characters are knocked off the board they can't recruit that character again so they've got up to three that they can put on the board but that's all they get you're not going to keep bringing those guys back once they've been defeated combat is super simple the items that you have or the skills that you have might add some bonus to your attack roll or to damage and the attacker is just going to roll these two dice and compare the value that they get when they add their attack value to to their roll to the defense value of the monster or the hero that they're fighting against. And then you'll do some damage, and once the damage reaches that character's health or whatever their maximum hit points are, that's how you're going to defeat them. After all the players have taken their turn, you've gone around, gone around the table, then the monsters get a turn. And the monsters' actions, the AI for the monsters is pretty simple. They're going to stay put if there's nobody next to them and they haven't been attacked. If they have been attacked, they're going to move towards the closest character, probably their attacker, more than likely, or they're going to attack that character if they're within range. So there are lots of monsters that are just going to sit there unless you do something with them or wind up standing right beside them at the end of your turn for some reason. And that could happen because one of the demon's powers is that they can move other characters around the board. They're manipulators. So it is very asymmetric in the way that it plays. So you've got simple combat, you've got a, a straightforward AI, you've got experience and leveling, you've got loot, you've treasure that you're getting, and items that can upgrade your character's abilities or, or their attack rolls. So it, it is a very classic men-on-the-map kind of a skirmish game, but it has been simplified in a way that al would allow the even the, the 10 or 11-year-olds, I think, to figure this one out. What skills, though, are you practicing when you play a game like Board Quest? Well, this is a game where you do have to plan ahead and make some strategic choices. You're deciding, am I going to try and take out a monster to build up my XP and to get some items? Am I going to spend that gold to get some items? Or do I want to recruit a character or upgrade a character? Um, how, how am I going to reach the ultimate goal of controlling those forts or defeating the other characters in the game? And when you are planning ahead and budgeting, when you're trying to uh, make your turns as efficient as possible so you get the maximum benefit from the actions that you're taking, those behaviors and skills that are about working towards a goal in an efficient, organized way, those fall under the executive functioning umbrella, the executive functioning skills, the abilities that you need to work towards a goal. And this is a game that where, where the, you're not going to get too bogged down by the complicated rules, although they're complex enough. Uh, and so it is about kind of developing your strategy and figuring out the best way to win with that faction that you've chosen at the start of the game. Final thoughts about Board Quest Tales of Lyria. Well, this is a game that is 
it's it's a classic kind of guys on a map uh, area control strategy game there's some battles and skirmish i like the upgrades and the loot and the things like i said before but it's accessible so i do like that the rules are straightforward enough and the ai isn't so complicated uh, where you know you can get younger kids in to play the game but it was still entertaining for the grown-ups who were playing i played this game with uh you know, four players all together including myself there, there were all four of us so we got to use all of the different factions one of the other players was a bit more familiar with these kinds of games the other two one was a teenager they'd never played it before but we all had a good time playing this game so it is it's accept it, it's accessible enough for new people to play it but the more experienced people had fun playing it too I like that you can play 2v2, that you can play on teams in this game. So it was more fun. I got to play with the young guy, uh, and that kind of made it a little bit more fun for me. And then I could give him some advice, and we could trade items back and forth. So that did make it fun. I think it's a great introduction to those kinds of strategy games where you're also leveling up, so to speak. You're leveling up your characters uh, as you play through the game, and you're trying to find that loot as you play through the game. The components, I think, are fantastic. Like, it's going to be really great when you've got minis on the table instead of these standees, but the components are great. You've got the thick cardboard pieces. You've got those thick dual-layer player boards. The artwork is great. Um, so this, I think, is is a game from a publisher that I wasn't familiar with until they, they sent me their game. Um, and they've really put some effort and some work into making it cool, making it accessible, and making it fun for the players. There are, though, a couple of downsides. Now, maybe these downsides will be addressed by the time the game is finalized and everything comes out. One thing I would say, this is a game that does come with a bunch of card size player aids. And I do like having card size player aids. But basically what the player aids did in the, in the prototype was they had one copy of each and it was almost the entire rule book spelled out again on these cards. What I wanted to have was... Here are the turn structures, and there's four copies of that, so everybody knows what they can do on a turn. Uh, maybe one card that had just what are the benefits and penalties of the different terrain types. You know, you can't shoot into or out of a forest, for example. That would be great to have a little card. They didn't include a card, I don't think, that talked about the terrain type. So uh, the player aids, I think, could use some improvement, especially when we're talking about making the game accessible to folks who don't have a lot of experience with these kinds of board games. There were, I mean, there were a few typos here and again on, on some of the cards, but I think the biggest thing, the biggest concern I always have about games like this, especially if they're long, this is an hour to two hours, which is not really super long in the scheme of things when we're talking about a strategic board game, but it is a game that could involve player elimination. You could knock a player out, you know, after 45 minutes of the game, one player might, you know, have their hero defeated, and then that's it. That game is done for them. They have to wait for the game to finish. They don't get to participate anymore. Uh, and that's something that's a, a bit hard to swallow for me when I'm playing games with younger kids. I want to play with them. I want to be involved in the game with them. Like, if I'm playing with my kids, you know, I don't want to knock one of them out of the game, and then they have to sit and watch me play with the other one until I get knocked. Usually it's me. I don't, I don't usually win these games when I play with my boys, but uh, I don't want anyone to be knocked out. So what would be great is if uh, they could, if there could be maybe a rules variant where uh, defeat of the hero doesn't necessarily completely eliminate the player from the game. Maybe they could get knocked back to their home fort or something or lose their items or their experience could drop. Uh, but it would be, uh, I, I think it would be more fun for all of the players involved uh, if there's, if you remove that player elimination or come up with the house rule to remove player in, in elimination as a factor in the game. But that, in a nutshell, is Board Quest Tales of Lyria. So thanks so much to the folks at Ramesware, Ramesware, for sending this game my way. If you have any questions, and like I said, I will put the, the, the campaign info in the show notes below the video. But if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments section below, or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca. Brainsongames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go. The previous ones are up there already. 
Brains on Games is the X handle on the Facebook page and the Instagram feed, so we're all over the place. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones, you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Thank you.